Welcome to what is quite possibly the most important lecture of tetrionics, namely the differentiation of zero point fields, mass energy geometries, and matter topologies using omega. In this lecture, we will use omega geometries and apply them in a way so as to be able to explain the origin of charge at the quantum level and differentiate between planar mass energies and material matter topologies. We'll also touch on how Omega itself provides a geometric reality to the current maths of physics. The reason why this is quite possibly the most important lecture of tetrionics is that most of the questions I have coming back to me regarding tetrionic theory and its um, ideas of what mass and matter and charge are all stem from a misunderstanding or a incomplete understanding of how tetrionics defines mass versus matter at the quantum level and the role that charge or omega geometries plays in facilitating this understanding. We've shown in previous lectures that, that mass is equivalent to energy via Einstein's mass energy equivalence formula, E equals mc squared. But what that formula fails to, sh to uh, include is a definition of matter, that is the material substances that make up our universe, things that we can touch and feel those particles that have substance as opposed to the immaterial fields of mass and energy that are around us, the light, the heat, etc. We've shown in previous lectures on the geometrics of omega, how omega can be arranged in a number of different ways, stemming from the fact that each Planck quantum coin has a positive and negative charge to either side of its fascia. We'll touch on that in a second. But needless to say, using equilateral quantum coins, we can tessellate or tile energy in a number of ways. But within physics, they always tile to create equilateral geometries. And we can read those geometries either left to right in a transverse fashion, as shown in this illustration here on the left-hand side, where by reading them left to right, we measure the quantum levels, the W plus or W minus bosons of the standard model. We can also read them longitudinally, that is in the same direction as the linear momentum. In doing so, we measure even number quanta or photons of energy. And those photons, as we've discussed, make up a normal distribution of mass energy momenta within the scalar equilateral field. So all fields of energy can be broken down into either transverse quantum levels or longitudinal photons of energy momenta. Again, in both cases, they're simply made up of a number of Planck quanta in which the positive and or negative faces are presented to the observer. This uh, simple arrangement is what forms the foundational building blocks of all mass and matter and fields of force within our universe. There's nothing complicated about it. It's simply the tiling or tessellation of these equilateral quantum coins that creates everything that we can see, feel or measure in our universe. The quantum coins themselves have a plus or minus side. And this can be best illustrated via the, uh, the logo on the Tetrionics uh, web page, which I'll show you now. This is an illustration or an animation of a Planck quantum coin. It's just a single quantum coin rotating freely in space. You can see that it's made up of an electric field on either side, either positive or negative, and a magnetic dipole on both sides, negative being south-north, 
the positive face having a north south but it, this is the basic geometry of all Planck quantum coins and an innumerable number of these Planck coins are what make up everything in our universe take the quantum coins out of our universe and you're left with empty space there's no heat, no heat, light, fields of force, no matter, nothing. Everything that we can see, hear, feel, sense and measure is made up of these coins at the quantum level. And as I've said, the rearrangement of these coins in certain sequences is what creates everything in physics. So with respect to that quantum coin, having either a positive or negative charged field, we now have some basic definitions of physics that we can apply to use as building blocks of our understanding of how quantum mechanics comes about, including the probability distributions so familiar to people doing quantum mechanics. In tetrionics, each coin of energy, of Planck energy, which is energy momenta, with the, the momenta being omega, the angular quantized angular momentum mass omega is Planck's constant the omega is the equilateral geometry of each field and viewed from either side a positive field viewed from the opposite side of this page would in fact be seen as a negative field and vice versa a negative field from this side viewed from the opposite side would indeed be a positive these form the quantum of charge. Each side is a positive or a negative charge, but the energy is just a quantum of energy. It could be, it's not thought of in tetrionics as positive energy or negative energy, it's positive or negative charge with coins of energy. The quantums of charge are expressed in tetrionics as a small case Q to differentiate them from elementary charges which will come into play later in this discussion. So a plus or a minus Q or elementary charge either side of the quantum coin then interact via their magnetic and their electric fields to begin to form fields of mass energy bosons and photons. As we mentioned in the previous discussion each Planck coin, H nu, can be thought of as being half a photon. A photon being a positive and negative neutral charge carrier, electromagnetic quantum. The boson, the W, the W plus and W minus bosons are obviously charged, electromagnetic charge carriers. They are either plus or minus. In reality, that's either side of the quantum coin. So the formulation for a zero point field of energy would be H nu or a half HF. Either way, zero point energy creates an electromagnetic field, which we then define as being charge via its inductive rotation, as we've drawn here or which in reality doesn't exist, but it's a, it's a handy term which we'll relate later on to inertial mass the inductive mass or the inductive loop when viewed from either side of the coin is seen to rotate in one direction or the other for positive charge quanta the inductive loop will be modeled as rotating in a clockwise direction whereas the negatives rotate or flux in an anti-clockwise direction and again it's just the result of the the symmetry of Planck coins. There is no motion of energy, there is no flux or spin or curl, there's no um, no motion at per se, it is simply the result of the field geometry. Every quantum coin has an electric component and a magnetic dipole moment. And it's the orientation of those fields that determines whether it's positive or negative but the quantum coin has a positive and negative side to each and every one of them. That plays an important role down the track, but not in this lecture. 
so from that we can see that we have in the case of zero point energy the ability to produce two forms of quantum charges plus or minus as I mentioned and we model these as W in the, the standard model as W minus W plus or W minus bosons the photon again would be two of these back to us uh, joined together along the magnetic dipole to create a diamond shaped geometry and that would be a photon where the can the, the positive and negative charges cancel out again we have a zero point singularity at the very center of each charge field and there is a difference between zero point fields or zero point the electromagnetic field versus the zero point energy one is a property of the other the energy is the the um, foundational property the emergent properties are the electromagnetic fields depending on our measurement of one side or the other zero point fields of course were first introduced by Einstein back in 1930 in response to Planck's quantization of energy as he sought a, a solution for the the spectral line emissions these geometries the plus and the minus are the foundational building blocks of everything you'll see many discussions I've had with people about what is the source of quantum charge in physics modern physics has no explanation for what creates charge because they use the, there is no geometry to energy in the standard model at present or in any model at present in bar tetrionics and accordingly there's no explanation as to what creates a charge of either positive negative or neutral on the surface of any particle or any within any field we now see that the zero point energies themselves have a positive and negative charge inherent on either side and the arrangement of these plus and minus charges or W plus and minus bosons within the scale of fields is what creates all the fields and forces and, and material particles that we can measure and observe the zero point fields themselves are ideal quantum inductors that is to say that they're their quantum equilateral geometry, the omega of Planck's constant, can be viewed as a um, as a short-circuited quantum inductor. For those not familiar with electrical engineering terms, an inductor is just a coil of wire. Many of you have probably, in, in high school science experiments, have probably coiled a wire around a nail in order to make an electromagnet that is all a zero point field is except it uses a flat equilateral geometry to achieve the same were you to imagine or perhaps I could even draw a battery here sorry that's a bit rough but if there was a battery at this point here the energy from that battery would go down this side here into the inductor very rough up and down the coil of wire and then flow back to the other side of the battery in doing that the energy would flow around in a clockwise direction for a pot to create a positive charge where the bar magnet the inductor would create a north on this side on the left hand side and a south pole on the right hand side if the energy was if the battery was reversed or the coil was wound in the opposite direction you would in fact have a negative charge created because the south would appear on the left and the north would appear on the right so the flux or the flow of energy that's illustrated in tetrionics is purely for electrical flow convention and you'll see during the course of this lecture that it does not necessarily imply any real flow of energy from electric to a magnetic the field is a static field the north-south magnetic dipole and the electric field are all static what's moving 
are us the observers in the, the physics experiments. So, as I just mentioned, we have an electric vector component, which is what creates acceleration of particles. If there was a uh, charged particle within the, a field, if this was an electromagnetic, electrostatic field, and there was a charged particle, the electric field would accelerate it in that direction, depending on the charge. If it was this, an opposite charge, it would draw it in. And if similarly, if there was a magnetic pole brought in, it would be accelerated in a tangential direction at 90 degrees to the electric. That's the basics of EM field mechanics. The electric fields accelerate, magnetic fields push in a sideways direction to the electric field or to the acceleration of the particle. As I mentioned we've got for all intents and purposes plus and minus zero point fields either side of the quantum coin and we can model them as a clockwise or anti-clockwise flow of energy or a flux of energy but at no time is there a single magnetic pole north or south created it's always dipole pairs north south south north for positive or negative fields so magnetic monopoles as often speculated in physics and, and uh, physical theories do not exist and that's in line with Maxwell's laws as well Maxwell's unified laws for electromagnetism uh, using Gauss's work show that or predict that there should never be a magnetic monopole the search for magnetic monopoles is a search um, to try and prove a new aspect of physics or to disprove the unified uh, field equations of Maxwell in order to generate some new understanding of physics but it will not succeed because magnetic dipoles are inherent property or inherent geometric properties of every zero point field of energy every quantum coin has a dipole be it north south or south north you will never find a single magnetic pole by itself so we can rearrange all these um, quantum coins as i've mentioned classical mechanics talks of scalar fields and that's if you like the surface area of the equilateral triangle with its electromagnetic components the square root linear momentum the uh, Leibniz's vis-a-vis -vis the, the force of, of life of the energy itself versus linear momentum and acceleration of Newton Planck's breakthrough was to quantize that very same scalar energy and that brought about quantum mechanics where we have quantum levels, W bosons, and of course, measuring the W bosons in a different direction gives us longitudinal masses or photons of electromagnetic energy versus bosons. So we still have scalars of energy, but now because of Planck's quantization, we can break them up into bosons and photons. And of course, we've now already from the previous lectures derived the unified field equation where we can say mass omega or Planck's constant nu squared is equivalent to mass velocity squared via the geometry. And measurements of this in any spatial field over time or via the impedance of the space of the region of space gives us measurements of inertial mass. So again, energy is related to mass via C squared, or the region of space, the impedance of the region of space that you're measuring. Because it's the impedance of the electric permeability and the magnetic electric permittivity and the magnetic permeability that determines the velocity of light. It's slower in glass and air than it is in a vacuum. But in a vacuum, it's said to be um, the speed of light is set at C and we can use C squared spatial coordinates to define mass 
in terms of energy and show that they are equivalent via the square of the speed of light. We can also, as I've said, quantize this using Planck's constant to give us bosons and photons and it's the distribution of photons one, two, three, well, sorry, quanta, three, four quanta, five quanta, up to a maximum amplitude and then back down to zero that creates a normal distribution and that's the basis of the probability curves and the probability mechanics in quantum mechanics. The probability mechanics and the probabilities that you'll find regarding a, a particle's location or the, the probability of finding a particle all stem from the distribution of mass energy within its chem field. If there was a particle of mo in motion here, the red dot would indicate the particle and the equilateral field would be its chem field, its kinetic EM field. There's an electric component, there's a magnetic dipole component and it points in the direction of motion and of course the square root of that chem field equates to the linear momentum of the particle. Again, related to mass via the velocity, etc. We've touched on all these before. But this is just to highlight the point that whereas classical mechanics deals with a scalar distribution or a measurement of energy that can be either electric or magnetic and wasn't so in Newton's time, it was only so in Faraday and Maxwell's time, we have now quantized it after Planck and with Einstein to give us quantum mechanics, the quantization of these scalar fields. So this left hand side if you like is the classical mechanics picture of energy or mass energy momenta whereas the right hand side is the quantum mechanical picture of that very same mass energy momenta and all we've done is applied omega to the formulations and the understanding that omega is in fact quantized angular momentum or equilateral geometry at the quantum level so these quantum coins, as I've said, you'll see illustrated in the quantum mechanics ebooks as having this faint EM flux between the electric field and the two poles of the magnetic dipole. It will flux in one direction or the other. That's purely a, uh, a descriptive way of showing that each quantum, each side of the quantum coin can be thought of as a short-circuited inductive loop and here you can see the inductor at the base where the magnetic dipole forms the electrical energy flows in one direction or the other or is modeled as flowing in one direction or the other to create the positive and negative charges this is an extremely handy analogy even though there's no physical flux or spin or curl at the quantum level but it's extremely handy in explaining inertial mass, which, which we'll touch on very shortly. So an, in in a, an ideal inductive inductor at the quantum level has inductance, but it has no resistance or it, it won't wind down or lose energy over time. It will always maintain a set amount of energy, a zero point quantum of energy and it will have a positive and negative side to this. You, you cannot lose energy and it cannot gain energy. All you can do is add a number of these coins together in order to create fields of more and more energy momenta or mass energy momenta. In reality, what's described in the standard model or in physics at present as a quantum oscillator, which is how Planck described it and how Einstein in fact described it and most texts do does not oscillate a zero point field fluxes or spins and curls in one direction only if you were to model it it would always be rotating in a positive field would always be rotating in a clockwise direction and a negative field would be rotating in an anti-clockwise you can change this circumstance for example if you were to wind that inductor 
in the opposite direction. Instead of twisting it in one direction, you twist it in the opposite direction. You would change the north-south field presentation that it would generate, and you could make a positive flux, uh, a clockwise rotation or flux, create a negative field. So as I said, it's not a perfect analogy, but it does what we need it to do. And over the application of many, many things, such as Lorentz corrections and and uh, helical windings, etc., that we'll cover in other lectures, you'll find the most appropriate model is clockwise for positive, anti-clockwise for negative. And it, it suits terminology-wise anyway. But again, these fluxes, these rotations or flow of energy, are in fact equilateral geometries. And after the QM book, I don't use them. I just simply show the plus and minus charges on the matter and gravitational fields, etc. So they're only shown in the QM book in order to stress a point about how we could physically model the quantum level at the macro using electrical components and also as a tool to explain inertial mass as opposed to gravitational mass when we get into the cosmology ebook lectures. So obviously now that we have a zero point field or zero point energy quantum coin with plus and minus zero point fields either side these fields can interact via their electric and magnetic components and that's what they do but the quantum inductive circuits come together to form larger and larger equilateral fields or photons and bosons of electromagnetic energy but the important thing is there is no oscillation there is no changing of as if we were to look at this page the left hand side as it's modeled would always be a positive field and the right would always be a negative they wouldn't be flipping between positive and negative in order to get them to flip between positive and negative all the time we would have to have a capacitor at the top so that it would charge up and discharge at that point it would circulate backwards and forwards but it would no longer be true a true representation of what's going on at the quantum level zero-point fields, Planck quanta, quantum coins are fixed. The only way you can change the charge on the face that's presented is to look at it from the opposite direction, from the underneath of the page. But the symmetry that you see here represented on the page would remain true even if you were viewing it from the other side. It's part of the charge chirality, as it's called, of the fields themselves. And it's an important part because it's not until you cut out and use and model these fields with yourself by yourself using the templates that you realize that in my case anyway what you think is going on field wise with plus and minus fields isn't actually happening isn't the geometry that you expect for example some people and myself included might be tempted to cut out triangles and put button magnets in the positions I'm indicating now with a north face pointing up and a south face pointing up on this side were you to do that you would find that the opposite side of this would still be a positive charge not a negative as it should be there's a symmetry at work here that has to be learnt you have to re-educate your mind and the best way to do it is to follow Tetrionics 101 with the templates and make models of these quantum coins. Once you have a field established, these charge arrangements, whatever f arrangement they come in or form, do not change. They're locked in because the magnetic dipoles will lock up against each other to form the fields and they prevent any rotation like we saw on the, the animation just before. It's only when a quantum coin is free in space and there's no other fields around it, electric or magnetic, that it can sit there and spin happily as you saw in that animation. These quantum coins are in fact not only quantum of electromagnetic energy with quantized angular momentum, equilateral geometries, omega, they also have 
as per Newton, square root linear momentum. And changing the number of quanta within any scalar field changes the energy momenta or the mass energy momenta that's available to do work. That is to say, if you envisage four triangles instead of one in the same area, there's four times the square root linear momentum able to do work. And they point, well, a net of them point out of four, three will point towards the same point I'm highlighting here, and one will point towards the, the zero point. But three to one ratio is still stronger than one. So there's a net divergent force and a convergent component to that force. So as we build up fields of equilateral energy momenta, or Planck quantum coins, fields of these coins, irrespective of their charge arrangement, will develop a convergent component in addition to their divergent component. There will be forces pushing out as well as some forces pulling in. And that's the basis of why opposites attract and similars repel. This mixture, this interactive force rather than a strictly divergent force. It's buried within the geometry. It's not explained within the math. The math can model it, but it offers no explanation as to why opposites attract and similars repel. Tetrionics shows it up quite easily. And again, we can now equate energy per light second to a measurement of mass, or inertial mass in particular, because it's, it's the more quanta you have, the more force you're able to apply. And accordingly, because each quanta is made up of an inductive loop, these inductive loops resist change. They're quite happy as ideal inductive loops to sit at their energy level forever, creating a specific amount of energy momenta, or mass energy momenta. But if you try to change it, the only way to do it is to change the number of quanta within that field. And in doing so, you, in change, you change the inductance of that field, or you change its inertial mass. So now we have a connection between inductive mass energy and inertial mass, which is something, again, that modern physics doesn't provide us. There is no explanation, even with the Higgs boson, as to what creates inertial mass. Inertial mass is created by inductive loops in the zero-point fields within the quantum coins that make up each and every piece of matter and each and every field of mass energy in the universe. And as I've said, and as I've shown in the previous lectures, we can organize and measure this energy, the scalar fields of energy, in various ways, but they always form up in the same way. Equilateral quantum coins always form scalar, equilateral scalar fields of electromagnetic energy momenta. We can measure it transversely, and we'll measure odd number quote, uh, quanta, odd number coins, which will be positive and negative alternating right across, but because they're odd number, there will always be more positive than negative or more negative than positive, so they'll always have a charge. They'll never balance out exactly. Hence why they are positive and negative W bosons. A neutral boson is a measurement in this direction where you have a plus and a minus together or a number in that direction. It's not shown on this illustration. A direct up and down or longitudinal measurement as opposed to a tangential or a transverse measurement is a measurement of photons, positive and negative quanta, one above each other. If you look closely at the illustration, you'll see that they're pair sets, so they're even numbers. Even Planck quanta distributions form photons and EM waves. They give us the wave functions of quantum mechanics. They give us the probabilities because they form this normal distribution where it goes from zero increasing up to the 
the uh, the maximum square root amplitude of the wave and then back down to zero and were there to be a particle associated with this field if it was a chem field or um, an electromagnetic field the particle will be located in this sort of position generating the field or it may be a particle moving in and the closeness to the other particle i.e. its its uh, its location i suppose its its distance from the other particle well its motion will be defect it will be let me try and rephrase this its motion with respect to the particle that's generating the field will be affected according to the number of quanta that are available remember i said that these are plus and minus charges pointing up and down an interactive field of energy momenta and as the particle moves in depending on its charge it will either be attracted or repelled but that attraction and repulsion is all determined by the arrangement of the quantum coins within this field and of course the field itself can be defined as an equilateral field of energy momenta mass velocity squared or mass omega h Planck quanta squared either are equivalent to each other depending whether you're talking quantized angular momentum or scalar energy momentum but they still have this pi radian geometry to them so we can measure this triangle in any number of set ways transversely tangentially longitudinally or in a scalar fashion but it's the number and charge of the zero point fields within that scalar field that brings about the physics of these forces and the, the charge interactions that we measure in physics so in a nutshell the difference between Newton and Planck is tetrionic theory all tetrionic theory says at its most fundamental form is that omega in Planck's constant mass omega the omega is an equilateral geometry it's not a spin it's not a curl it's not a flux as I've mentioned it can be modeled as that but in reality it is simply an equilateral triangle of electromagnetic energy and again you have an electric component and a magnetic dipole component just as you have in classical mechanics except in quantum mechanics everything is made up of these tiny tiny triangles of energy and in order to create a large scalar field you have to put a large number of Planck quantum coins into that field they will always fill in that distribution pattern where the square root of the scalar field is the linear momentum the highest amplitude of the wave where it can exert the most force as you move away from the particle the force gets weaker and weaker but the strength of that field in the case of a particle is determined by the velocity it's linear momentum is mass velocity the square root of the scalar field mass velocity squared and we can relate mass velocity and velocity squared the scalar components to the quantized components through omega the quantized angular momentum so the omega geometry is what tetrionics brings to physics and our understanding of how nature creates charge and mass and energy and and matter at the quantum scale it doesn't worry about the mathematics the mathematics emerges from the geometry the geometry is the inherent part the omega is inherent in nature the mathematics simply describes what up until now has been unknown using tetrionic theory we now know that omega in Planck's constant is an equilateral geometry again this you'll hear terms like spin curl flux throughout quantum mechanics throughout physics in general integer spins um, electromagnetic curls or magnetic electric um, electric fluxes 
all these terms will pop up time and time again. Every time you see it, you have to think an equilateral geometry. If you do that, you'll begin to relate things very quickly and very easily to how Tetrionis explains it. But if you're unaware that spin, curl and flux are in fact omega or quantized angular momentum, the equilateral geometry in particular, if you're unaware of that relationship, a lot of what's said in tetrionics becomes confusing. And that's where a lot of people fall apart and, and, and come unstuck in looking at tetrionics. Because quite often they'll jump to their field of specialty, be it gravity or cosmology or electrodynamics, and they won't be aware of this subtle but very important relationship. Once this relationship's explained, and they model it themselves using the templates again, these things become self-evident. And you soon begin dropping the terms of spin, curl and flux out of the vocabulary. In fact, the very definition of quantized angular momentum in the textbooks is that it's a rotational angular momentum at the quantum scale. There is, again, no rotational angular momentum until we build particles then you can have a classical rotation about a point a, a spinning particle for example but that doesn't exist at the quantum level that's not the source of charge charge is created by the arrangement of plus and minus Planck quanta with their square root linear momentum to an active force within a scalar field. It's the geometry of Omega that's the key to understanding how nature builds all these, everything that we see in physics or in nature itself. You can see here, I've actually tiled some scalar fields with plus and minus quantum coins. And you can see how the quantum levels have an imbalance. Second quantum level has three charges. It's a W boson. It has two positive and one negative. Therefore, it has a net charge, quantum charge, of plus one. So it's a positive W boson. On the other side, over here on the right, we have the same field, but we have two negatives and one positive. So it's a W negative boson. Again, odd numbers, quantum levels, transverse measurements of the scalar field are W bosons. They are either positive or negative. There is no way around it. They will always be positive or negative. They will never, being an odd number, they will never ever come out as a zero net field. The only way to have a zero net field is to measure them in the other direction, longitudinally. We'll take a slice here. Positive, then negative, positive, then negative, positive, then negative, positive, then negative. We could go over here, positive and negative, positive. Doesn't matter where we sample, we're now measuring longitudinal photons of energy. Positive and negatives cancel out to make a neutral photon of energy. Two bosons, two nu equals HF. Two bosons make a photon. Doesn't matter whether they're positive, positive negative or negative positive depending on the charge of the scalar field that is how you will always measure them there was a term that was in use back in early pre um, quantum mechanics of transverse and longitudinal masses they described bosons and photons they came about through measurements of acceleration and measurements of ampere forces between two conducting wires but again Longitudinal and transverse masses are photons and bosons, respectively. All they are is differing measurements of the same scalar fields. Where we have quantum charges within a scalar field, they always add up to create a net charge. But the arrangement of Planck quantum coins within that charge field be it electrostatic or electromagnetic, results in 
what's called an unbalanced or broken energy symmetry. The equilateral geometry of any field always results in either a positive or negative charge. The only way it can result in a neutral charge is if a positive and negative charge field come together to form an electromagnetic field versus an electrostatic. Electrostatic fields are always positive or negatively charged. Electromagnetic field has no charge but it has magnetic a strong magnetic dipole. We'll explain this in the next lecture or the one after. But it's the the geometry of the scalar field that results in the asymmetric or broken symmetry that leads to charge at the quantum level. You cannot avoid it. Using Planck quantum coins you will always create a charge distribution or a quantum distribution that results in either a positive or negative charge field and we can measure that in many various ways as shown there in the mathematics but the positive and negative fields are the result of the geometry their SI units are mass seconds they're a measurement of Planck quanta per light second mass omega per C squared which gives us mass seconds in SI units and it's obviously a positive net positive mass seconds or n negative mass seconds and this is the basic definition of charge mass seconds if you ignore the energy content that's here and just look at the flux or the the magnetic dipole arrangement of the fields you would actually be defining time seconds mass seconds in a clockwise direction is positive charge mass seconds in a anti-clockwise direction is negative time so the electromagnetic modeling of inductive loops gives us a definition of time we'll cover that way back further as time goes in cosmology we'll actually define and and explain time both as a measurement of charge and a measurement of entropy in a system but for the moment chart quantum charges are measurements of plus or minus mass seconds and again terms like spin flux and curl are not real descriptive terms but they can be used in order to model the arrangement of these Planck quantum coins within any scalar field it's the arrangement of the coins plus or minus that gives us positive or negative charges at the quantum level right through to our macroscopic measurements of electrostatic and electromagnetic fields so what's normally perceived in terms of spin quantum integer spin uh, curl and flux electromagnetics and electrostatics um, from our classical mechanics at the macro scale is shown not to be the case it can be used as a modeling tool but it's not the real geometry the real mechanism behind the creation of charge and how we come up with the mathematical formulations for E equals MV squared and E equals H nu is Omega the equilateral geometry the the quantized angular momentum Omega is the key part if you don't understand that Omega is an equilateral triangle the rest of tetrionics becomes disjointed and, and confusing especially when you take it from the perspective of trying to understand gravity or um, chemistry or why the periodic elements have the shape they have etc charge is the key thing that a quantum coin creates you might think it's energy it's not energy by itself is neither positive or negative it's the opposite charged sides of the quantum coin that are key to creating the universe as we perceive it and measure it because it's the po opposite charges of the plus and minus um, fascia that allow the magnetic dipoles to come together to form photons 
that then allow bosons to come together to form scalar energies to exert a force over a distance and it's those same charges electric and magnetic within the, the scalar fields that go on to create matter and fields of interaction between particles of matter energy zero point energy by itself is of no consequence what is of consequence is the charged fascia zero point fields of those quantum coins the charged fascia allow us to build everything to exert forces to create matter and to then manipulate and reverse that process so that we can get clean limitless energy etc so what we now have via the geometry omega and the understanding that omega is a plus or minus um, zero point field on either side of the quantum coin is the ability to firstly unite classical mechanics with quantum mechanics we can show this classic classical mechanics deals with the scalar fields electromagnetic inertial mass etc whereas quantum mechanics deals with chopping that same field up into the smallest components that can make it and those components are the quantum coins so we just simply chop it up via omega Planck's constant is mass omega kilograms square meters per second mass omega so using the omega geometry we can now chop up scalar fields of classic me classical mechanics and derive the transverse bosons and longitudinal photons and the quantized angular momentum the spin the curl etc of and the probability distributions of quantum mechanics so all of that emerges from using a simple equilateral geometry you can try it with other geometries and they won't work i have tried equilateral triangles work and in and also equilaterals are the simplest form to be used they're the first choice I and mean, like obviously mechanics up until now quantum and classical have have based their work on spheres and circles but once you use the equilateral triangle and relate it to omega everything else becomes self-evident the transverse bosons the longitudinal photons the scalar energies the electromagnetic fields of charge everything emerges from this geometry and secondly having defined and related mass to energy with energy being a timeless measurement of the ability to do work via the square root linear momentum we can take a time measurement of that same energy as it does work and derive formulas for inertial mass the response to a force energy applies a force over a distance inertial mass is a measurement of an object's ability to respond to that force over time it's a measurement of the acceleration due to a force f equals ma delta um, delta v delta mv over t accordingly now that we've defined mass as a planar or mass energy as a planar relationship via the equilateral geometry of Planck's constant we can now define matter and include it in the equations up until now including relativity all that's been formulated is mass energy with its momenta relationship mass energy momenta matter has been left out of the equation out of the formulation three-dimensional matter is exactly that it's a three-dimensional shape it's a topology as it's called in in tetrionics we have four mass energy geometries planar fields of mass energy quantum coins coming together in a way to form a tetrahedral 
solid just like a platonic solid it's a tetrahedral solid it's the first platonic solid and that shape has the mass energy in the four sides but the four sides are no longer xy planar sheets of energy they now even though they're still sheets of energy they create a 3d solid so the sides having built or followed tetrionics 101 i hope you will see and you'll know that you take four quanta mass energy geometries and you can fold them into a tetrahedral solid the tetrahedral solid in tetrionics has a name it's called a tetrion it's what gives tetrionics its name and it simply is the word for a particle of matter it's the quantum of matter it's the building block just as a Planck coin is the building block of mass energy a tetrion is the building block of all matter it's the the smallest chunk of matter possible that's what the Planck, what the the Greeks were chasing when they devised the term atom if you keep chopping up um, a bar of gold till you get its individual gold atoms you can then start chopping those atoms up and you will come down to baryons or protons and neutrons and electrons you can then chop them up again and you will find tetrions the tetrions are the building blocks of matter three-dimensional matter topologies they occupy a a volume of space they enclose a volume and the mass energy fascia exclude matter or exclude mass energy sorry from inside the matter itself creates a null space where there is no energy or no mass energy at all within matter they are a 3d standing wave of mass energy the energy circulates endlessly in that tetrahedral form but now we have a definition where we're starting to use we've defined and we're now differentiating between the words mass and matter you should now when you hear the word mass think flat sheets two-dimensional sheets of energy and when you hear matter you think of a, a tetrahedral volume or a tetrahedral solid taking up a volume but made up of mass energy so now the term mass matter has a particular meaning in ordinary physics text it doesn't and the two words are often interchanged the mass of a particle of matter photons as massless particles they can't be massless because we've already determined that a photon has energy momenta it has two Planck quanta which are mass omega photons cannot be massless they can be matterless because they don't have any volume they're planar sheets of energy so massless photons is incorrect matterless photons would indeed be correct and we'll touch on that shortly so having defined or differentiated between mass and matter both of which are electromagnetic forms of energy we can now start to look at how we can put those Planck quantum coins together and what difference that makes to matter itself obviously as we increase the number of Planck quantum coins increase the odd numbers of both the, the odd numbered bosons in the scalar fields we increase in odd number steps to create squared numbered scalar fields as we do so we increase the energy levels which increases the momenta in the field because the square root linear momentum is related to the scalar equilateral field through the geometry so we step from one quanta being n1 to four quanta which is again the square of two two times two is four we then jump up with another five quanta to give us nine quantum in total so an energy level of n3 and we could increase that again and it has to be a step of seven a w boson of seven to increase it to 16 quanta 
or an N4 squared scalar field and we can continue onwards. So we start at N1 and we increase via odd numbers to create equilateral scalar fields. These are the energy fields with their respective quantum levels in quantum mechanics. Now you should be able to associate W bosons and odd numbers immediately with the term quantum level. And that a transition between energy levels, which is a squared number, is just the release or addition of an odd number to that field. It's the difference of two squares, as Fermi would have said. But these are the principal quantum levels or principal energy levels of particles in quantum mechanics. And accordingly, if the charged mass energies make up the tetrions that make up the matter topologies themselves, we have an interesting relationship which isn't again presented in modern physics as it's explained. That is, in the in the case of all matter, as we increase the energy level, and here in this illustration we have N1, N2, N3, N4, up to N8, deuterium nuclei, so their energy level is raised up one energy level at a time in the tower, which corresponds to a, um, uh, an atomic shell in a, a periodic or elemental nuclei. So atomic shells equal quantum principal quantum numbers as we increase this we must remember increase so we create squared numbers but because protons and neutrons are identical except for their charge and they're made up of these equilateral mass energies they must have identical mass energies themselves that is to say a proton-neutron pair at N1 energy level have exactly the same number of mass energy quantum coins in their each charge fascia as each other. A neutron is not heavier than a proton at the same energy level. N1 neutron is has exactly the same mass and shape charged topology as an N1 proton. The only difference between the neutron and the proton is the quarks and tetrions that make up the, the particles result in a different charge. We'll touch again on that very shortly, and particularly in depth in later discussions. But these energy levels must always increase because of the equilateral geometry of Planck's constant, quantum coins, must always increase in a rigid fashion. As they increase via the, the quantum inductors, the W bosons, the zero, each of which is a zero point field, you can see that they couple via the magnetic dipoles. That is to say, the magnetic dipoles of the zero point fields come together to join. They join here. You can see there's a, a big area or big sec cross section where the north and south dipole have joined and only a very small cross section where the electric plus and minus charges meet so the majority of the coupling here is via what's called a coupled inductance that is to say the inductors the inductive bases of the zero point fields are what's coming together it's like two bar magnets north and south coming together to join they're brought together and again their charge arrangements of the zero point fields is such that there's always more positive than negative or more negative than positive within that scalar field and we can measure these bosons odd numbered couplings transversely or we could measure them as even numbered photons longitudinally in which case you'd have a photon here and one and a half photons or three bosons at this point. So there's various ways of electromagnetically describing this arrangement, but the coupling is via 
the inductive bases via the inductance and we can say that the W bosons are parallel inductances side by side one there for this negative zero point a parallel one there for the positive zero point we could say in the case of photons they couple you can see the coupling that I spoke about here in which case we have a photon of energy which could be described as a dual boson depending again on the direction of measurement within that scalar field what's termed as the weak force in um, quantum mechanics is in fact this magnetic coupling where the magnetic fields join together as a coupled inductance is the electromagnetic term for the weak force the strong force in nuclear physics is where two of these electromagnetic scalar fields come together parallel to each other like two sheets of glass or two hands a positive and negative hand or a left and right hand come together and they stick together that's the strong force holding the two sheets together via their parallel faces whereas the weak force is like holding your hands out and the two wrists are what's holding it together different types of force all arising from electromagnetic coupling but the very first force that comes together that, that starts to bring these quantum coins together in scalar fields so we can do work and we can exert forces and create bosons and photons is the weak force and again it just follows the equilateral geometry of omega itself as I said doesn't matter the charge of the particle all baryons or all proton neutron particles have identical matter topologies that is to say that the mass energy momenta the charged mass energy momenta of each is arranged in such a way that they create identical matter forms the only difference between a proton neutron or an anti neutron and a negatron or anti proton is the charge in the case of protons we have 24 positive charges making them up and 12 negative resulting in a net elementary charge of plus 12 in the case of neutrons and anti neutrons they both have a balanced arrangement of charges of 18 positive and 18 negative so there's an equalization in the charge that we can observe and we say they are neutral particles in the case of antimatter the 24 positive and 12 negative of a proton is reversed so we have 12 positives and 24 negatives resulting in a net charge of minus 12 the exact opposite of the proton but in all cases proton antiproton neutron antineutron they are identical mirror images of each other and it's this arrangement of charges resulting from omega again within the mass energy of the matter topologies that brings neutral particles together to join with positive particles and brings anti neutrals together with negatives and stops anti neutrals joining with protons and stops neutrons joining with anti neutrons the symmetry of the charge because of the omega geometry is such that we end up with distinct types of matter antimatter and neutronium that arise simply because of omega geometry of the, the quantum coin it, there's nothing complex in it and if you've made the models from tetrionics 101 to labor the point you will know how easy it is to make these particles in all their forms what of course is interesting as I hinted before is that if you're viewing the mass energy of the charged fascia of these matter topologies as inductive loops 
you can relate the inductive mass energies to inertial mass energies because the quantum inductors of Planck's constants of the quantum coins doesn't want to change its energy level to do so you have to add and chain add and remove specific amounts namely W bosons from the scalar fields but whatever energy is there make whatever mass energy is there making up the matter topology will resist a change in its energy level and accordingly will resist if if something goes to push on that particle these inductive loops trying to move through the aether of zero point energies in space and space is full of zero point energies when all these inductive loops that make up the mass of the matter topology try to move they resist there's a it's like trying to move a loop of wire through a magnetic field there will be a lens force back on that loop and it acts in such a way as to resist changes and that's the exact definition of inertial mass so we can now relate inertial mass to inductive masses and we can show that the number of Planck quanta charges affects the inertial mass of an object the gravitational mass is another thing entirely when inertial masses make a matter topology the 3d topology of the matter particle displaces a certain amount of space with its zero point energy and that energy pushes back that is gravitational mass it's a different mechanism entirely but until you learn how to differentiate between planar mass energy geometries and 3d matter topologies you can't understand that definition you can't understand the mechanics behind gravity versus inertial mass or gravitational mass versus inertial mass and how to explain them more importantly do take the time to read these illustrations because chapter 3 is the important one as I've mentioned on the the, the blogs to date without an understanding of how this comes about and and how to differentiate between mass energy geometries matter topologies things get very difficult so we start with our zero point coins the quantum coins the Planck coins zero point fields of energy plus or minus charges and then we use those fields of mass energy and we combine them via their weak force magnetic dipoles and their strong force scalar EM field charges parallel charges remember bringing them together or repelling them in the case of similar charges and we can create three types of tetrions a positive a negative and two forms of neutral which are indistinguishable from each other they're both equal numbers of positive and negative charges under the laws of tetrionics charged energy will always seek equilibrium either energy densities or charges themselves so these positive and negatives are attractive even the negatives are attracted to positives in the neutrals and positives are attracted to negatives in the neutral as well as a negative component negative tetrion itself and they combine here you can see a, uh, a down quark on the right hand side here is made up of two neutral tetrions and a negative tetrion resulting in a net charge of minus four an up quark has two positives with a neutral sandwiched in between to create a net charge of plus four these are partial charges remember partial elementary but we now know the elementary charge of plus and minus one is in fact plus and minus twelve through the geometry of mass energy in matter so in the case of leptons three tetrions can come together to form positrons neutrinos again two neutral particles 
almost identical to each other save for their charge arrangement and electrons all negative charge particles and they can also then the, the quarks themselves can interact in groups of three to form protons, neutrons, antineutrons and antiprotons and despite having exactly opposite charges the proton at plus 12 is decidedly different to the electron at minus 12 so the elementary charge which we've measured for so long in physics is actually can be said to be a reflection of the matter topology of a particle we can now differentiate based on charge what each particle is and how each particle is made up and more importantly we can show that it's the arrangement of quantum coins in the fields these equilateral fields of mass energy that make up the matter topologies that are shown on this illustration it's the arrangement and the asymmetry the fact that there's more positive or negative or more negative than positive depending on the field it's that arrangement that gives rise to the elementary charges of the particles themselves so charge an inherent property of omega is unbroken unbalanced at the quantum level because of the geometry of omega to give us all these different particles and to give us not only different particles and families but matter and antimatter within those same fields all these possible combinations have been drawn up and they'll be explained in later lectures but for the moment we can now see that matter particles are always 4 pi 4 8 12 36 4 n pi groupings of tetrions or groupings of mass energy so one tetrion is 4 pi or 4 fields of mass energy momenta whereas a baryon has 36 charged fascia another way to describe or to name these fascia given um, the, the arrangement of charges is to note that the scalar field in this case for all charged fascia has a net charge we've already said that bosons with their odd number quanta are charge carriers so a charge field in this case which can be defined as a, a boson it's unique from the odd number bosons the W bosons because it has a squared number each charged facer always has a squared number of quanta Planck coins in that charged fascia so this in the case of say um, baryons protons neutrons with 36 charge fascia we could in fact imply that they are a form of bosons in particular because they explain the inertial mass of matter given that there's 36 charged bosons within the matter or making up the matter topology of a baryon we could imply that these are in fact Higgs bosons the mechanism that they explain by virtue of the fact that they have Planck coins making them up and these Planck coins are inductive slash inertial loops of mass energy describes the function of Higgs boson exactly previously until about two years ago I just called them charged fascia but it's quite appropriate to call them Higgs bosons they are completely distinct from a W boson because W's are again odd numbered Planck quanta lined up in a transverse fashion these are scalar charged fields of Planck bosons of, of Planck quanta a squared number H nu squared versus H nu odd H nu so we could indeed term these or define these as Higgs bosons each charged fascia of mass of inertial mass energy in a that makes up a matter topology 12 for leptons 
12 again for quarks, 4 for tetrions, 36 for baryons, is in fact the number of Higgs bosons that make up the inertial mass of the matter topology. We can accordingly break up, as I've, I've hinted, all the particles, including tetrions, which are missing from the standard model, to show the partial charges of quarks, plus one third, minus one third, and minus one third, plus two thirds, etc. These are all one third, two third charges of an elementary charge of plus or minus 12. We see that the charge arrangements not only give us plus or minus 12 positrons and, and electrons, but also produce neutral particles known as neutrinos. But now the difference is we know that these particles are made up of quantum charge fields, Higgs bosons, made up of quantum coins. So the Higgs fields had these quantum coins making them up and the summing of the positive and negative quantum coins, the asymmetric arrangement of plus and minus quantum coins in any field gives us the resultant elementary charge or the particles family topology what baryons look like protons and neutrons what neutrinos look like or what leptons look like neutrinos positrons electrons they're all the same matter topology what varies from them in them in that family is the charge arrangement of the Higgs bosons and the quantum coins within those that give the, the Higgs their charges and the amount of quantum coins in those fields, i.e. the amount of mass energy in the matter. Again, we're now starting to differentiate between and showing that the power of knowing the difference between mass and matter. Matter is the particle's topology, its shape. Mass is the amount of energy. Inertial mass is the resistance of that particle and its energy that makes it up to resist a force that's applied to it. And the more energy you have, equilateral mass energies, Planck quanta, making up the charged surfaces of each particle, the more resistance or the heavier it is in a gra the more resistance it is to a force, the heavier it is in a gravitational field. All these physical properties are described simply by knowing what omega is and that omega is equivalent to pi radians or truncated pi radians um, as we've explained it in the previous lectures. So in tetrionics we have plus and minus charge geometries, mass energies, making up a matter topology which is always designated with a T for tetrionics. T equals 4n pi. It's just a simple way of shortening the statement. So matter topologies are made up of mass energy geometries, Planck coins, in scalar fields. Whereas the standard model implies that everything is a spherical particle, it has no real explanation for the plus and minus one third partial charges of quarks. It has no inkling that tetrions exist with identical mass energy or charge mass charge ratios to the leptons and to some quarks and the model itself implies that a lighter particle such as a neutrino should indeed be smaller than a neutron or a lepton electron tetrionics now shows us that that's quite the opposite electrons and positrons and neutrinos have exactly the same physical size, the same matter topology as each other. What changes is the energy content in those charged fascia of those particles. Less energy or less quantum coins in the charged fascia, we have a lighter particle because there's less inductive loops to resist the force, to resist the change of a force that is applied to it. So therefore it appears lighter 
as inertial mass perspective to the velocity against or the acceleration from a force that's applied. They have exactly the same matter topologies because they're made up of the same quantum coins, just less of them and a different charge arrangement. So the standard model of spherical point particles can now be dismissed. What's the implications? Well, obviously, the Bohr model of a spherical proton being orbited by a smaller, lighter electron is incorrect. We know they're not spherical. We know they're made up of smaller charges. And more importantly, we know that they're made up of omega geometries. So therefore, they're not spherical, even in the, the broadest sense. They're made up, that their construction is such that they form those, these, geom these topologies. The charge topologies are distinctly different from a, a point particle. Although, in the case of tetrions, 4 pi tetrahedrals are equivalent to 4 pi spheres on the macro scale. gauss bonnet theorem proves that. Um, something you can search if you like. But we can, using tetrionics, and, and this will be in the, the chemistry lectures, we can relate the energy levels to the atomic shells. There's the energy levels there, 1 to 8. To the atomic shells, K2R. And their electron orbitals, of the electron spinning around the cloud, or even as a fuzzy um, electron cloud itself, instead of an orbit, in the, the standard model, can now be shown to be completely incorrect because the electrons reside half embedded in each deuteron, which is a proton-neutron pair. And the mass energies of the fa in the fascia, mass energy geometries that make up the matter topologies, increases as the energy level increases. We start at 25 squared, to 26 squared, to 27, up to 32 squared for these energy levels. And this illustration on the right-hand side is, in fact, element 120 of the periodic table. And all the periodic elements are contained in that illustration. Again, part of chemistry. But tetrionics, using the unified theory developed from omega, will show you how to bring all of these shapes together via their charge, weak and strong interactions, to form all the known periodic elements. So the other difference that pops up and can be explained is that we can now differentiate between charge, remembering again that it's the symmetry of the, the electric and magnetic dipole on either side of a Planck coin that determines the charge, and then the arrangement of these Planck coins within a field, between a, in a quantized scalar field, that results in the asymmetry of plus or minus electrostatic fields. We can now define that charge is a measure measure of mass energy arrangements, the omega, how omega is distributed, or how the quantum coins are distributed, the Planck mass energy within a scalar field. It's the arrangement, the distribution of mass energy creates charge in charged electrostatic fields, or photons within electromagnetic fields. And we can now differentiate that from current. Probably not so big for those that aren't familiar with the electrical dynamics, but electrodynamics and electrical theory becomes extremely important, and that's in the second ebook. Again, we can now define charge as an arrangement or a distribution, asymmetric distribution of mass energy, quantum coins, equilateral geometries. Current is a measure of matter in motion, be it electrons or protons typically being pushed by a force typically we will measure the amount of charge going past a point in coulombs all we're measuring as we've now defined is the amount of matter particles how many chunks of matter made up of charged mass energies are going past a detector at any given point it's matter in motion not mass energy matter in motion has a chem field. If this tetrion were being pushed by a force, it would have a secondary chem field created. The chem field would have the mass energies of force and the linear momentum of the particle in it. 
and those mass energies contribute to the mass energy of the matter now you're starting to see how confusing this can get if you don't understand the difference between mass and matter it's critical that you understand this subtle difference between a to geometry and a topology between mass and matter and even differentiate the two between energy so that you can understand these particles and how the elementary charge is a measure of the particles topology and that the mass energy of its chem field when it's pushed or accelerated or when it's in motion is a measure or an addition of mass energy to the mass of the matter topology and how charge mass energies create distinct matter topologies families of particles what's an example of how confusing this can get here's a classic in a lot of physics texts you'll see the equation E equals NHV equals HF or a way of phrasing it would be say the number of Planck quanta equals the energy of a system which can be a measure of the frequency of the photons it is incorrect to equate the number of quanta Planck coins to the photon frequency in any scalar field because we've already said that bosons Planck quanta are odd numbers photons are even numbered pairings odds and evens to say h nu equals e equals hf is to say odds equals evens or one equals two it takes two bosons to make a photon remember a Planck quantum coin is half hf it's a positive or negative charge half a photon that was defined by Einstein himself when he was searching for zero point energy. It was defined again by Planck when he sought to define the quantum oscillator. But we've again shown that although you can model it like this, they are unidirectional. They do not oscillate. The flux is always clockwise or anti-clockwise if you choose to model it as that. But in reality, it's the distribution of plus and minus quantum coins in the field that determine whether a Higgs boson is plus or minus or whether the ch a charged fascia of any matter particle is plus or minus or whether a field is electrostatic or electromagnetic two Planck quanta make a photon you must always write the equation as 2nhf a uh, 2nh nu equals E equals NHF or at the simplest form form two plane quanta equals the energy of a photon that then gives us the correct formulation for a zero point field or a, zero, a quantum of zero point energy it allows us to define charge as we have to find electrostatic electromagnetic fields to explain the broken symmetry to explain why charge fields attract and or repel through fields of interaction to explain why particles have their the shape that they have it's because of the <clears throat> the arrangement of Planck quantum coins in the field that create the that bring about the asymmetry of charge and it, it boils down to its most basic as omega is the geometry of charge and the measurement of energy per unit of time or per light second in relativity is the measure of inertial mass inertial masses or inertial mass energy geometries that come together via their charge interactions to form matter topologies create the family of particles or they in turn can create fields of interaction for those particles that accelerate them that give motion to all the matter in the universe so in this one quick discussion this one lecture on on these few illustrations we've covered 
charge asymmetry, the origin of charge, the source of inertial mass, why particles look and behave the way they do, the incorrectness of assuming that lighter particles are smaller than their same family um, counterparts. Neutrinos have exactly the same physical size as an electron. And that's important down the track when we talk about neutronium in, in neutron stars, for example, or antimatter in general. They need to be specific sizes in order for the particles themselves to interact in such a way as to create light. So here again we show that math by itself doesn't give these answers. But the inclusion of geometry, omega, equilateral geometries to Planck's constant, suddenly we have a flow of information that we've never had before. More importantly, we can paint a picture of bosons and photons with their inductive loops of inertial mass with respect to their scalar energies and their square root linear momentum. We can talk about these things, mass energy geometries, asymmetric charge fields, and you can see them. You can see the relationship between Planck quanta and photon frequencies. And you know that the, the relationship is not the same because they're not geometrically the same. Mathematically, you can quite easily say H nu equals E equals HF. And in fact, a lot of people do say, instead of nu, they say frequency. It's mixed up and you can say you can swap mass for matter and call particle uh, fields of mass energy photons as massless particles when in fact they do have inertial mass quite obviously because they can exert a force they have linear momentum square root linear momentum they have a measurement of energy because of that the, the square of the linear momentum amplitude is a measurement of the scalar energies that make up that field. We know that they're quantized because of Planck's constant with mass omega. So now for, therefore we can draw this relationship of, of energy to linear momentum and we know that linear momentum mv squared equals E for energy. So we can show that with m v we must have a measurement of mass for photons photons have energy they are not massless particles but they have no z component they have no matter topology so they can be termed matterless this is where crucial formation of words crucial definitions of mass matter energy omega Things like that that are commonplace in the maths of physics need to be redefined, re-enunciated, so that everyone is clear. From the previous lectures, we know that mass is a measure of energy per light second. We also know that matter is a measure of energy per light second squared because it has a matter, a physical material topology. Massless particles infers no linear momentum, but we know it exists through the geometry and through measurements of electrons, of um, photons. We know that they can exert a force ever so feebly. Photons in a gravitational field can now be defined as being weightless. Because they have no matter topology, they have no weight in a gravitational field. They're not massless, but they are weightless. They are matterless because they have no material topology. Again, you can see the need to, to explain these terms and to build them up geometrically, which is where we spent the previous seven lectures, building the models, explaining it, redefining things, leading up to this point. This is why this lecture is so critical, because until you get firm in your own mind the the difference between mass energy and matter and what role charge plays 
in creating matter topologies and the various types of fields of mass energy tetrionics is confusing you need to get those definitions clear and very precise I still stumble at times but for the most part once you get it very clear it all falls into place so now that we have our measurements of light seconds we have our measurement of energy within those spatial coordinate groupings as either defined as inertial mass or inertial mass matter topology versus geometry we can use the same things in order to clearly explain what we are trying what we are measuring and what makes up what we're measuring or brings about the physics of what we measure in nature so we have at the very least an understanding that omega in Planck's constant which is related to pi geometries is again related to the mass energy geometries of a matter topology we'll go into the why they have different numbers but the short answer is that when the strong force of interaction occurs between material particles between tetrions two of the faces that come together to create the strong force end up hidden so in the case of quarks three tetrions come together 12 faces but four of those faces are hidden so quarks like leptons are dodecahedral they have 12 charged mass energy geometries that make them up but because quarks opposite charges attract they form a different matter topology an 8 pi octahedral topology versus the dodecahedral the 12 pi fascia of leptons leptons have distinctly different matter topologies to there's a dodecahedral there's the lepton there's the octahedral quark distinctly different matter topologies although they're both made up of 12 dodecahedral or 12 charged faces of mass energy so 12 mass energies making eight charged faces that we can measure octahedral quarks or in the case of where strong force repels instead of attracting we end up with a dodecahedral lepton topology over time you'll grow more familiar and more accustomed to using the word topology to represent matter geometry for planar mass energies and of course we have baryons protons neutrons identical to each other with the same mass energies the only thing that's changed is the arrangement of Planck coins the charges the, the charge of the Higgs bosons within each of the particles so of the 36 charged Higgs bosons of mass energy that make up a baryon 20 are still available to be seen it's still exposed to the observer 16 of them are hidden because opposite charged Higgs bosons come together to form the strong force so 16 of them are hidden within the matter topology and again then protons and neutrons come to combine to form deuterium nuclei along with the the electron obviously proton neutron electron to form deuterium which in turn make up <coughs> excuse me the uh, elementary particles the building blocks of periodic elements and again just to highlight the point these are deuterium nuclei of differing mass energy levels different principal energy levels and the quantum levels relate to different atomic shells and each element is made up of z number of proton neutron electron pairs there is an equal number of proton electron neutrons in each element there is not an excess number of neutrons surrounding a z number to make up or to account for the molar mass or the observed mass of any particle 
when you do the math, and we'll discuss this when we do the chemistry discussions, will show that these changing energy levels in accordance with Schrodinger's equations and Bohr's uh, atomic shells and suborbitals fully accounts for the molar masses of the elements. So there's no need to invoke um, excess neutrons, etc. A discussion for another day. Thanks for your time on this one. This has been a critical one. I hope I've gotten the point through, but if you're struggling with anything, um, feel free to message me and we'll have a chat. We'll go through the points that need to be discussed. Um, the takeaway from this, obviously, is that we've now shown how quantum coins, and more specifically the arrangement of quantum coins, equilateral quantum coins, within scalar fields, gives rise to mass energies, and inevitably to matter at the quantum scale. It explains charge, inertial mass, m the particle of material, the, the families of material particles. All these things are explained through the equilateral geometry of Planck's constant, or and specifically, omega. Thanks for your time. Um, I hope you, again, have, have grabbed the, or grasped the, uh, the main points because this is crucial as I go on to explain the rest of quantum mechanics. Thanks.